What's up? This is Ali Einhorn, host of the Talk House podcast. Today I'm joined by... Hi, it's Amy Rose Spiegel, Talk House Music's Editor-in-Chief. And we have some very exciting news. We are so stoked to tell you that we've been nominated for a Webby Award. Woo! We've been honored in the podcast and digital audio category for Best Individual Episode. This was a very powerful episode featuring Rose McGowan and Meredith Graves in conversation. Now, you probably know that Rose and Meredith are both really vocal feminists. This conversation is especially interesting because it takes place just before sexual harassment exploded into a wider national conversation. Loyal listeners, in case you missed this, which I know you didn't, you can check it out at iTunes, Stitcher, or on our SoundCloud page. And if you like it, there's actually two components to this Webby Award. In the first, the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences selects whom they think should be the winner. But in the second, you do. So if you like the episode, please go to the Webby Award site and vote for us. You can also find the direct voting link at TalkHouse.com. And while you're there, why not check out Meredith and Rose's incredible past contributions? Rock the vote! We want you. What's up? This is Elia Einhorn. Welcome back to the TalkHouse podcast. Today I'm joined by... Nick Dawson, Editor-in-Chief of TalkHouse Film. And we have a very cool show for you. Eliza Hitman in conversation with Lynn Ramsey. Lynn Ramsey. She's from my hometown of Edinburgh in Scotland. It might recognize an accent, listeners. Aye. And, uh, <laughs> and she's talking to, to one of my favorite filmmakers from my uh, home borough of Brooklyn, Eliza Hitman. And she is now a three-peat winner. This is her hat trick for the TalkHouse podcast. Within a year as well. Within way less than a year. She spoke with Barry Jenkins. When her movie Beach Rats came out, indeed. And then she was on our Oscar round table. Over at the Kickstarter HQ. Now, listeners, in case you somehow missed those other episodes, which I know you didn't, Nick, tell us a little bit about Miss Hitman. Of course. Writer-director of It Felt Like Love, of Beach Rats. She's done a couple of episodes on the excellent season two of the also excellent high maintenance, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already, along with those movies. She's just basically a badass. Another badass, finally returning with her new movie, Lynn Ramsey. She's back, and I'm very, very happy she's back. It's been a minute since we need to talk about Kevin, but this movie, you would never really hear her new film, reminds us why we need her in our lives. Powerhouse. She's a powerhouse, you know... Everybody has, of course, seen all of her films. <laughs> uh, Ratcatcher, Morven Collar, and then we need to talk about Kevin. And this is kind of a, a new speed for her. It's a thriller. It has Joaquin Phoenix in it. It is just the most brilliantly constructed film. The, the performances, the, the, the writing, the direction, the score, the editing, the cinematography, everything is just so specific and perfectly constructed and great. And just it's, it's a masterclass in filmmaking. Now that, listeners, is a review that you will not often hear from Nick Dawson. That is a powerful, powerful review. I'm not going to jinx anything, but let's just say Oscars 2019, we'll see. We'll see. It's fucking great, though. It's fucking great. Now, listeners, we do want to give you a warning. There are some spoilers in this conversation. Yeah. It would help if you've seen the movie. If you haven't, it's not good. The, the, the film is the film, but uh, they talk about some of the pivotal moments of the movie, some of the special moments of the movie. So listeners, what we're saying is press pause right now, get to the movie theater, watch the movie, and then hit play again. Yeah. They also get into the often thorny issue of the adaptation process. They do. This is the second movie that Lynn has adapted from a, a novel. She, of course, did Lionel Shriver's We Need to Talk About Kevin. And this new movie, You Would Never Really Hear, is based on a short novel by Jonathan Ames. And, and the way that she adapts it, and, and also writes screenplays is, is very innovative. So that's really fascinating. I also thought it was very cool to hear how she recovers from the insane stresses of filming. Right. I think that's something also that, that Eliza was very keen to hear. It's really important to, to find balance with your work and, and your personal life. They also get into something that I thought was surprising, Ramsey's desire to make a comedy. The challenges of making an action movie for the first time. And not always understanding the real power of the art you're making. And on that note, I think we should just dive in. Let's do it. Okay. Where are you staying? Uh, oh, 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the Greenwich Hotel, yeah, like, which is nice because you can it's got a swimming pool in it, you know. <gasps> so Amazing. for New York, that's kind of brilliant. So I went for a swim at half six this morning and thought and felt all great this morning. And now I'm like, oh, I'm totally knackered, you know. Because like, <laughs> I've got my daughter here as well. Like, oh, yeah, how yeah. old is your daughter? Um, three. Oh. Uh, yeah, so. I have a three-year-old too. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> His name is Jonas. Uh, mine's is Georgie, oh. yeah. Um, yeah, and it's it's hard juggling, like, kind of doing what we do. And then, like, you know, luck, uh, luckily I've got a supporting partner, so he's, like, kind of... But I'm taking her around, like, so she gets an adventure. So that's cool, yeah. Well, if you want to have a play date. <laughs> <laughs> I might well do, actually. We are coming back to New York for a couple of days, so that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to meet you in a playground somewhere. All right, that's a day. That's a day. <laughs> All right. um, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying that about a month ago, Nick, who runs the Talk House, posted something on his Facebook page. And it said, you know... Who would you like to see interview Lynn Ramsey? And there was about 300 responses wow. of people who were fighting <laughs> to have the opportunity to sit oh. in a room with you. Oh my God. <laughs> and somehow I won. Oh, really? The bid <laughs> on this. I don't know how. Oh. But I guess there's a lot of pressure on me not to fuck it up. <laughs> Well, I feel a lot of pressure in me as well for that because I had to be like kind of um, like, I don't know, awake after all this press. <laughs> be here now, you know. Anyway. Um, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of your work. Oh, thank you. I love all your short films. I love all your feature films and I love your new film. Oh, great. So That's congratulations. <laughs> um, I guess I, I will start by asking you... Um, a question about sort of living in violent worlds in your films. And I, I am also a filmmaker, and, yeah. and my films often culminate in sort of small transgressive acts mm. of violence. Oh, wait, see those? <laughs> and um, while I'm writing them, I don't, I don't think about it too deeply or have that much of a reaction to it. But whenever I start shooting, yeah. I have an intense feeling of sort of dread and regret. Like, why am I making a movie that <laughs> is so dark? And I'm just wondering, you yeah. know, if you feel that too. And it's not something that male directors often talk about. You know, the effect yeah. of working, yeah. you know, with violent themes. Yeah, um... Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think, well, yeah, I'd really like to do a comedy. <laughs> um, and sometimes I think, you know, uh, you know, I try, I try and put quite a lot of humour in things, even though, if, you know, I hate it when people say, oh, it's so grim. Like, uh, that word's, like, particularly, you know, annoying in some way, or, you know, abhorrent in a way, because it, it's just like, I don't try and work in one tone, yeah. Like, and, but, yeah, like, I mean, you know, sometimes I've done things that are, you know, they... It's something I don't even realise, like, how they affect people, like, until later, you know. Um, there's been a few times where, you know, when the, the film screened at Cannes, it was, like, you know, it was a bit of a surprise. It was a bit in the midst of it. And I didn't really get a chance to really think about it. Um, and then most people had seen it being about six people in a room, you know. Uh, and then it was a lot of people. And, and then you could... My sister was in the audience, like, um, and she was like, oh, people were crying or, you know, they were shocked and that they, there was all these different reactions and people were, like, saying, holy shit, you know, and getting shocked at things. And, and I was like, oh, my God, what, what have I made? What is this beast? Um, but, but yeah, I, I just like exploring, you know, humanity in general, like, and that's the dark, the light, you know, um... Uh, maybe I've got some kind of messed up, crazy mind, I don't know. Um, uh, but I do think um, the reality is it's a violent world, world we live in. And even though this movie here is like, you know, like, a lot of people would be termed violent, I, you know, it's much less explicitly violent than a lot of things. Um, and I think that's kind of why it's shocking, because I think explicit violence has become so banal that when you take away all the things that you can hold on to, it, be, it being cool or a bit comic book or a bit this and that. And don't get me wrong, I still wanted to make a film and a movie and a genre film and something that drives you forward and is exciting to watch. Um, but I think without those footholds, it's really scary, 
you for people, you know? Like if I were to take a moment mm. um, from your new film, like mm. where Joaquin Phoenix like takes out his tooth, you know, something that's very genre-y. Yeah. And, like what do you, the director, sort of think about in those moments aside from wanting it to look and feel credible? But is there, is there a re response or reaction from you personally within that moment? That came about actually... You, you know, actually, in, it's based in a short novel by Jonathan Ames, and, and you know the the injury actually was a shot to the leg. You know, um, and it was all you know there was a great scene of the bullet being extracted. And it was pretty gross and um, and painful, and you felt this like you know Joe's kind of like you know like numbness to to to, to pain, and also how could he do this? And there was a good scene and stuff like that. But Joaquin and I talked about it during prep, and it was. And, then, you know, one thing he was worried about and um, was, like, you know, you have that kind of thing where he has to limp through the half of the film um, and that being a kind of prop in itself and, like, having to remember the certain times, you know, like, just the whole, the acting of it, you know, you know. And then he was like, well, what, what if it's really personal? So we talked about that, what's really personal? Well, it's the face, you know, so... Once we get into that chain of thought, it was like the whole mise en scene of that scene came alive for me. But yeah, it was, you know, we shot it in this alleyway, alleyway up in Harlem somewhere. And um, it was, um, it wasn't until we put this, we were doing the sound work, I think, the sound, that it's the sound that makes that so extreme, you know, it was like... Um, I remember people really wincing and again that like you get used to you know you're you you're making the movie and you've seen it and stuff like that and then again this uh, reaction you know when an audience sees it you're like oh my god but but there was something much more interesting to me that it was the, the whole violence of the film is very mechanical at first and then it becomes quite personal in more than ways than one not just physically emotionally and um, and also later on it becomes you don't even see the violence. It's a kind of post-violence you see, but you can fill in the gaps, you know what I mean? You don't need to see five guys come down, like, if you see the aftermath, you know? Um, I, I don't think audiences are dumb, and, and I think he's so beyond rage at that point that it made some sort of sense to me psychologically. You're talking about adapting, mm -mm. you know, this Jonathan Ames novel, and, and I was sort of wondering, you know, what your general approach is to adapting <laughs> a book into a screenplay because you're able yeah. to preserve, mm. you know, a first person narrative, I think, from yeah. novel to, to film in a way that is challenging and you're able to really externalize the internal. And I'm just wondering sort of how you explore tone through adaptation and wow. first person narratives, I yeah. guess. I don't know. I've just I've, I've realized I've been I've always gravitated towards character studies, and I never knew I was kind of doing that. And when I, you know, I wasn't like conscious of it, but you know, I thought I'm here. I'm making, making a pulpy B noir action movie. You know, kind of head trip. I don't know what it is. You know, it's like kind of very experiential film. I think I'm making that, and then I'm making it about this guy really, and I'm really in his headspace. So. I think we, I will look back at being a photographer and always like taking, you know, I always took portraits of people or when I painted, I always painted people. It was like, I was always interested in, you know, just like, just the details in a person, you know, like and what, what's going on in their mind, you know. Um, so I think I've never, ever done a straight adaptation. Like, so I think the first thing I said to Jonathan was like, I, it, it won't be like the book probably, you know, I'm going to go my own way, you know, um, but the zealot, the thing I love about the book is the, the bones of this character, the sort of like the structure, the, the kind of feeling of uh, who he is, the, the, the body being scarred, like, you know, that he's a guy that walks about like a ghost in his own life who, you know, doesn't want to be here. And um, that he lives with his mom and all that sort of stuff. There was some really amazing stuff. And it was like, but Jonathan, like the book had only been released in France and he was still writing things. So he, you know, hadn't even got to an end in a way. So I'm, I, I kind of took it my own way and um, a lot of things were different. Like the mum was, the relationship with the mum and Joe was much, like there was much more of it in the film. Uh, in the book, it was, it was, it was beautiful, but it, you know, we, I think we ran, especially Joachim and I ran with this idea where, you know, he does love her, but like caring for an elderly person is also really frustrating and it's kind of funny, you know, and then, so we, we wanted some humour in the movie and it never feeling tonally just, 
you know, getting back to this dark thing that it's just a dark thing, you know, like, it's, like sometimes it was, he was, he'd play something that was really like, you know, he looked like the demon coming, you know, like it was, he was terrifying and the next minute it would be funny, like it would be silly and and it was quite tender, that relationship. And I think adding that kind of dimension of the reality of caring for an older woman, like, you know, or an older parent, like it's just like, you know, and how they drive you nuts, like was interesting territory for us and that was so I explored that much more he was cool in the fact that you know he, he was like I trust you enough to go in your own direction and the great thing is that even though it's quite different I think it retains the spirit of what he started with and like it was something he that was a really great beginning but also he's like seen the film four times and I think he's seen it again tonight and so it's you know you don't want it to you know take your own direction and then feel like you know, it was his inception and, you know, it, it, so I'm happy he likes it, you know, I'm happy, you know. Um, he says it's like a kind of operatic version of his, his novel, so. And the same happened with Lionel Shriver in the last one. Um, we, that was a book of letters, you know. Um, we need to talk about Kevin. And so it was like a very, you, you wasn't any, you, something you would see very easily as a film. So, you, but she, I think, again, saw it as a companion piece and when she met, Asia Miller, she's seen the film and she met Asia Miller. She said, how do you do, Kevin? You know, she called him, you know, it was the Kevin, she she felt it, it translated, um, even though it was a very different thing. So luckily enough, even though um, I've, I've, I've sort of ran with, with my own kind of thing, um, I think in a sense that it's, it's been something that they've, both writers have kind of felt like the, 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 it did some justice to, the, to, to what they, they were trying to do as well. Yeah, so... You know, in terms of what you're talking about and Joaquin's performance, yeah. Um, for me, so much of the tension of the film is that he doesn't enjoy what he does, and that it triggers so much mm. sort of anxiety and dread and yeah. trauma. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, that's what's for me sort of unique about mm. the film mm. and where the real mm. kind of dramatic tension lies. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just wondering how you communicate that mm. on the page. Oh, it's hard to say. Um, Do you write a traditional script? You know, when, when you're making a character study and so much is about what the character is feeling about what they're yeah. doing, how does that get communicated to... You, you know, as a film director as well, I mean, like, during the script writing process is when you kind of, like, in, in a lot of ways, when I'm finding the film and, you know, we, by the time you get to make the film, you're kind of... I don't think you're, like... This one was, like, it was still a little bit in transition, but certainly, like, you've got a pretty good idea of how you're going to go at it, you know? But things evolve as well and, like, you know, the characters get flesh and bone and, you know... Um, and the size of Wakima was not something I'd never envisioned. And then, you know, he started, he came seven weeks earlier and was building up like that. And I was like, I really like this because it's like armour and mm -hmm. the way he walks and the way sh one shoulder goes up slightly and the physicality of the whole thing was like this beast, almost a wounded beast. So the, the, it just sort of suit everything um, about this character. Um and it became its own thing, you know, apart from the book, apart from how I'd imagine it or anything. It was just, like, evolving. Um, but in the scripts, I try and, like, it's pretty specifically, like, um, you know, visual and oral. And, and I think the more I've done them, the more economical I try and make them. So, like, I, they're not reams and reams. They don't have a lot of description. It's just they try and be very particular. So something feels... I don't write in shots either. I write, uh, you know, like, either something that feels like you're in a, de a detail... And something that feels like you're far away, you know, like a wide shot. But it doesn't say this is what that is. But I like it to be a good read, you know. And uh, the, the scripts was, you know, it was, it was pretty like, you know, I had the feel, same feeling as the book going forward. Um, but then the film becomes its own thing. And it's like, you know, this has been a really organic thing where, you know, it's, I made some changes late in the day in prep. I was like, that doesn't work. I don't think it works. Like, why did that seem always bother me? And then I found that I had a brainwave, you know, and was in the unique position of being able to say, you know, I'm totally changing that, you know, like, I don't think that works. And, that, you know, so, I, the, the, or you're shooting something and it doesn't work and you, you, you've got to go, God, that, you know, every day went really good. And then this day there was, sometimes the film's telling you something and it's telling you what it's going to be, you know, like, um, so I think it's all, for me, the whole thing's like, 
It starts from the script. I don't lock myself in the script. I don't go, this is, I'm just going out there to do exactly page by page. I think you've do got you to, write what he's feeling, you know, so that the yeah. audience knows or the readers know, you know, to track his emotional state, you know, because the um, whole film is about his emotional state. I think I should try and suggest it in a script rather than be, you know, because it's like to me, like the emotional state is like kind of how I'm approaching how I tell the story of this character visually and like with the sounds. So oh, it's really hard to describe. I, I just, it's like, um, it's just an instinct kind of thing. It's like, but I, you know, hopefully, I mean, I think it was quite a short script. It was like, but it's... How many mean, pages? You know, and I probably cut loads of dialogue out in the end. Well, I think it was only 100 pages to start with and I cut 20 pages when I came to New York and I realised I had 29 days to shoot because I was like, there's no way I can make this. So like, um, you know, and, and I'd never done an action sequence or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it was like, I was imagining I'll have four days for some balletic thing. And then I'm like, no, I've actually got a day or half a day and like kind of, you know, and it made me think about things in a really different way, which was good, you know. Um, did you lose days or did you? Um, no, I just, I just was having, you know, the experience of making, you know, three features before this and a few shorts, it was like, and, and you know, many things happening and, I think what you've got to do is like you've got to be you know clever about how you're going to use your time. So there's no point in saying I'm going to do this huge big sequence when you don't have the means to do it or the time. You're just going to fail in that respect. So you're like, how can I do this super? So everything was about an exercise in economy. Everything was like the DP and I. And I, I used to, I came from that background myself, so I think I feel I understand the language of shots and um, where how do we tell this you know, in three shots or how do we tell it in two or how do we tell it in one or how do, you know, it was that kind of thing because, mm. and that, that that's like a puzzle exercise and it's actually really kind of stimulating because you're like, you kind of find a way of, of, of doing things that feels more uh, precise in some ways, you know, but it wasn't easy. It was like I had to like write during prep, during shoot, you know, like cut things like um, that I thought were important, kill a few darlings, um, sit with the DP, you know, look after my daughter, you know what I mean? It was like, it was insanely intense, you know what I mean? Spend time with Joaquin, look at all those locations. And it was shot in the summer, which was brutal, you know, heat. But something in the whole, it had one of those kind of like, sometimes it's special in a film where there's a lot of creative, it was just an energy, there was a good energy, a kind of electricity in there. And um, I looked forward to every day, where it's like some days, like sometimes in a film shoot, you're just like, oh my God, will, will this ever end? It's like, it's so relentless. Um, it, it was like a crazy edit as well. It was like this like exercise and stripping back and stripping back and stri stripping back. And, um, did you strip you know, back you violence know. or did you want things to sort of play in that genre space? I, I'd, I guess, well, I'd, the way I'd filmed it was like so specific, like, you know, the stuff that was like after math, I, I didn't have the bits in between it, you join in the dots. So it was like, the, those aspects were quite set, you know. Um, the things that, that were more difficult were, you know, that I didn't want anything like the flashes of before or the post-traumatic stress or these crazy things happening in really banal situations to, to feel too spoon-fed or... You know, I wanted them to feel like splinters, like, you know, like as if broken glass was in his head, you know. And and so with the when the can thing came up, it was like, you know, we just shot that. Like we had we had storyboards in the film. It wasn't even like there was, you know, so there was a lot of kind of, we just shot that and then I had to just cut them in. And I think then what I could do after was to was to make that a bit more sophisticated and like to, to work. We, we, had, we had to pre-mix in five days, which was crazy, you know, um, for that as well. So... But it, it was the style of the film. The whole film seemed to just be telling us that it was going to be just a crazy yeah. trip. Compressed. You know? <laughs> Compressed and like lean and ferocious. Um, but it was, it was seat of your pants stuff all the way through. I didn't get a chance to relax, put it that way, you know. It was like, there's no kind of pondering too much. Um, but I think we edit, and you, you, it doesn't matter, you know, people can cut down edit times. What really makes sense in edits, it doesn't matter. You can cut a lot in one day, but the thinking time is really crucial. So I always think it's a really good thing to take a couple of steps back and try and get a break and just before you walk. Yeah, uh -huh. I, think it's, I think that's a good thing. Uh -huh. And then another filmmaker friend of mine, which who I think is an amazing filmmaker, like does something that I think is great. I wish I could do it. And I'm kind of jealous of this was, is he... 
Um, his name's Pavel Pavlovsky. I don't think I've pronounced that right. He'll probably kill me <laughs> for that. And he made this amazing film called Ida that, that won an Oscar. Mm -hmm. And um, he shoots uh, like a couple of weeks and then takes a break and then, shoot, you know, like right, it's just different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinks about it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Which is a kind of really interesting way of working, but, you know, nigh on impossible. Not everybody gets that privilege. Yeah. <laughs> Like, just as a filmmaker, I think, especially in an edit, like, it's, even if you're stuck or something in an edit, it's just a really good thing to have a few, you know, moments to, to, to sit back. And I think we all live in a world which it's like, we want the content now, we want the content now. Maybe people aren't thinking about that as much as possible, you know? Like, it's like, yeah, you can shoot loads of stuff and have great rushes and stuff like that. If you don't have enough time to cut it, then... What do you have, you know? Um, so, yeah, like I said, I love those people that are doing that kind of thing where their process is slightly different. Um, and if you could do that, then great, you know, so. Can I ask you about my favourite moment in the film? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Without being a spoiler, I love I love the moment in the mm. scene in the kitchen. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Where, um, <laughs> you know, this hit man or this man is about to die and they're yeah, both lying yeah, on the yeah. floor and they're singing to Charlene and... Yeah, yeah. Um, unexpectedly they hold hands <laughs> um and I just thought it was like a really beautiful moment and very unexpected mm. because mm. I don't know because you know, you know obviously it shows that his character is empathetic you yeah. know but uh, there's a moment of like shared vulnerability and yeah. fear yeah. that I'm just curious was that in the script or, or was that in the <laughs> the novel or was that a no. moment that you found organically in the writing process no, it wasn't in the novel. It was, uh, you know, it was a bit more of a straightforward get the information scene. Uh -huh. And I was like, I really don't want a straightforward get the information uh -huh. scene. People say really strange things when they're dying as well. They, like, they talk about their dogs or, you know, you know, it's like, a, so, so how we normally see things in a movie, we kind of turned it in its head a little bit. But, but I'm glad you said that was one of your favourite scenes because I... To me, what was more important when I was shooting that scene than anything was like that song, they, you know, in that moment they connect and, and the handhold thing was more important than anything you would get to lead you on to the next thing. Even though there's little snippets of very surreal little bits of information that can tie that together, it wasn't the most important thing. And I, it was, I was really like, it was one of those scenes and you'll know as a director where you're like, I've got to get this and it, you know, and it, it was a big deal for me to get it right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you like that one. <laughs> it's, it's the most beautiful scene, I think, in the movie. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we have three more minutes. Oh no, the clock is ticking. Okay, um, here's my life question. I guess, you know, as a powerhouse, you know, female director, you endure, you know, many you know, battles on set and battles to get things made. And I'm just curious, like, how you recover when it's all done and start over. Um, well, I, I guess every director, you know, gender aside, it's tough making movies, you know. Um, I mean, I think of myself as a filmmaker first, and I'm like, you know, I don't... I don't think I've... Had, I mean, in set, I've always... You know, once you're rocking and rolling and you're actually shooting is the best, it's like, you know, or you're in prep and you're... Like prep's always a bit of a kind of... You, you don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> so it's chaos. Um, so once you're, you know, the, you're there and you're starting making it, it's like, yeah, you're nervous. Like, you should be terrified every day, you know? Like, you really should. I think if you don't feel terrified, then there's something wrong, you know? But it's a great terror, you know? And I think... One of the things I really love is like having a gun in my head almost. Like I'm good with my back up against the wall. I, I think of the best ideas. Like I can't decide what I want in a restaurant, but on a film set, I'm like, I, you know, like with all that pressure, I'm like, you know, I know this is the right thing to do. But it's like the, the job description in a way. I mean, a, a director, you know, like you have some tough set decisions to make. You have to kill a few babies, like, or you rip your script up. You have to deal with difficult people sometimes and like are difficult situations. Um, but, you know, I've been really enjoying it lately. I find it really exhilarating, to be honest. Um, but unlike, you know, some films are like, are, are, it gets really life and death when you start, you've made films at, in the beginning when it's your first feature and stuff like that. It feels like so all-consuming. And it still does. But I think it's really fun to have fun, you know, and it's really, you know, good to enjoy it and then remember to enjoy, to enjoy it. And, um, and at the end of this one, it was great because I was like, 
let's just go make another movie. You know, like, this is such a cool, there's a cool cast, it's great actors, it's like, um, you know, it's a great crew, like, yeah, and, and it was sad when it finished. And um, and I think that felt like a real turning point for me, like, just in general, like, instead of feeling like, oh, woe is me, oh, my God, I've got all the worries of the world on my shoulders, you go, hey, this is great what I'm doing. So I think you've just got to sometimes start, step back and appreciate it. Um and also live your life, like, you know, life, like, for a long, for a long time, my, all my life was all about just making movies, like, and I hardly saw my family, and I was, like, always doing something else, and, you know, like, something to do with the next project, and I think just taking a bit of time just to sort of look around and see, you know, what's going on sometimes is, like, I mean, just hanging out, playing, you know, um, having fun, like, reading, you know, spending time in Greek islands, you know, like, you know, going for a walk, swimming, you know what I mean? Like, I think just, just need, you know, like, remember it's like, it's, it's, even when you're at your darkest hour, it's just such a privileged thing to do. And, and you know, and still, I, I remember Jane Campion saying say to me something like this, like, she, you know, she's amazing, like, was, you know, just play, just play, have fun, you know, and I, you know, it was a bad time where I was like having a bit of a breakdown about something, you know, and, 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 um, and that was good advice, you know, so I think the more you do it, just like the more it's like, you know, it's, it's just the best thing ever, you know, it's just the best thing ever and I just want to enjoy, enjoy it more, you know. Thank you. Nick, is it just me or was that talk the best thing ever? The best thing ever, as are so many of the Talk House podcast episodes that we run. Nick, I want to talk about so many of the Talk House podcasts we run because we are about to drop an amazing double feature next week. We are indeed. It is a blockbuster featuring... You, got, you ready? You ready? You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready, man. Okay, hold me back. <laughs> William Friedkin in oh, conversation man. Oh, man. with Guillermo del Toro. Boom! This is an amazing conversation that warranted a double episode drop. So first episode dropping this Tuesday, part two on Thursday during our usual podcast time. And this is a podcast we recorded in partnership with Fantasy Fair. Shouts. And you can listen to a 10 minute sneak preview. When? Today. Today? Today. And where do we listen? On Little Gold Man, Fantasy Fair's awards podcast. I will be on there give me a little context, talking with Katie Rich a little bit. It's going to be fucking awesome. And so is the double feature next week. Today's episode is recorded by Charles Mueller and co-produced by Mark Yoshizumi, a.k.a. Mark the Producer. As ever, go hit us up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And of course, what do we have on YouTube, Ellie? Remind us. We have full video episodes of all of the podcasts we recorded live at the Sono store here in New York. That includes episodes with DJ Premier, Kathleen Hanna, Prince Paul, ASAP Ferg, Chris Gethard. Need I go on? Check it out. And of course, get your daily dose of TalkHouse at TalkHouse.com. Written content, videos, podcasts, all the good shit. Till Tuesday. See you then.